this episode, my favorite movie of all time. Star Wars is space fantasy, so why are we talking about the science? I know, there's no sound in space. Ships shouldn't fly like airplanes, and there's no way a bunch of aliens should look human. But that makes it a more relatable movie, especially for kids. So I'm actually fine with all those choices. What I really don't like is when movies get basic science facts wrong for no reason. As a professor, my students often have serious misconceptions about space that they picked up from movies. Roger that. We're moving to Hubble. I then have to break these down before I can teach them what it's really like. You must unlearn what you have learned. But the other reason for this episode is to explore how science fiction inspires real science. That's definitely true for our first subject. Look, sir, droids. Androids are as old as science fiction. But the droids of Star Wars are iconic. Some have just functional properties, but other ones actually have personalities. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted scrap pile. We actually have the first type of droid today. Some help with our chores, others help us build cars, and at Las Cumbres Observatory, we actually have a robotic network of telescopes that does our observing for us. We've even put robots in space. In 2011, NASA launched Robonaut 2, which they call R2 for short. It's a humanoid robot that right now is being used for research, but they hope one day it could do dangerous tasks like repair the space station. In fact, my co-host on Known Universe, astronaut Mike Massimino, got to check one out up close. When we were fixing the Hubble, it was 117 screws that had to be removed. That would be good for a robot to do. An excellent job for robot. Let's show you an example here of the robot acquiring a tool and then handing it to you as if you're performing a spacewalking task right. right now. And here it is, coming around. Mm -hmm. There's also a robot you can talk to on the space station named Simon. Simon, do a positive yaw by 90 degrees. Wilco, positive yaw by 90 degrees. The Japanese space agency have sent robots to the ISS too. One is a tiny little humanoid named Kirobo. Kirobo kun, genki datta? And the other one is a floating sphere named Intball. Do those hovering robots remind you of anything? The first version of those was called Spheres. If you remember from Star Wars, these are very much like uh, the uh, target droid that Luke Skywalker was fighting against as he was trying to master the lightsaber. Students made this floating ball that shoots compressed air, and it's actually powered by an android phone. So we really do have droids in space. But when will droids be as smart as people? Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, noticed that processing power doubles every two years or so. So in only a few years, computers should have the same processing power as the human brain. But computational power is only part of the story. We also need software. There have been advances in artificial neural networks that try to make computers think a little bit like the human brain. But we're still a long way from computers that think like people. Please stop playing music. I love music. You can dance too. Favorite hits incoming. Cancel music. What else can I do for you? If he really likes the music, uh, I understand that. I understood. Do you like the music? I understand that. I, I did shake it before. Oh, the Academy didn't change you. Oh, I must have forgot. There's a battle going on right here. Our Not again. Come Forget on. it. Oh, what's up? Can you come back down here and play the game? I think worm has caught too much sun. Tatooine is famous for its twin suns. In fact, binary stars are really common. About a third of star systems actually have more than one star. But can you have a planet in this configuration? Yes! There are actually two ways this can happen. One is like the movie Avatar, where you have two stars orbiting a common center of mass, and the planet is only orbiting one of the stars. In that case, one of the suns should be really big in the sky, and the other one is farther away. But you can also get into a situation where the stars are on opposite sides of the sky, so you have no nighttime. For Tatooine, the two stars orbit each other, and the planet is much farther away. That means we can get nighttime, 
but it also means that the stars should be about the same size and they should rise and set together. In fact, we've got confirmation that this is true because between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, it's about 18 years and we don't suddenly see one star being a lot bigger and closer than the other. Astronomers have even discovered a real life Tatooine. Kepler-16b is a part rock, part gas, Saturn-sized planet orbiting a pair of stars found by the Kepler spacecraft. The system is just inside the inner edge of its habitable zone. So, if there's a moon around that planet, there could be aliens enjoying a binary sunset right now. It's remarkable that we live in a time where we can confirm real Tatooines that were science fiction in 1977. We all want to see this. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. One of the things Star Wars is most famous for is its holograms. Although technically that's not a hologram, a real hologram is an interference pattern illuminated with a reference beam, the kind of thing you have on your credit card. What we really want is 3D video. One of the closest in recent memory was Tupac performing with Snoop Dogg at Coachella in 2012. Break out the champagne glasses up. But that wasn't true 3D video either. It's a 3D rendering of Tupac that's projected using mirrors onto a semi-transparent screen. The technique is actually centuries old. It's called Pepper's Ghost. That's the same trick Disney uses in the Haunted Mansion. There are actually animatronic ghosts underneath your buggy and they're projected into the line of sight by a sheet of glass. But to get real 3D images, we need to show a different image to each eye. That's hard without glasses, but the Nintendo 3DS did it by putting a barrier just in front of the screen. Maybe the closest people have come are these spinning contraptions that give the illusion of something floating in space. There are also little adapters you can buy for your cell phone that achieve a similar effect. But still, nobody's fully achieved free-floating 3D video like we saw in Star Wars. You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon? Should I have? It's a ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. For me, the most frustrating mistake in Star Wars is the parsec. A parsec sounds like a unit of time, but it's actually a unit of distance. A parsec is how far a star would be if its parallax is one arc second. An arc second is one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. But what's parallax? Well, if you hold your finger in front of your eye and blink, you'll see your finger moving relative to background objects. The same thing happens as the Earth orbits the Sun. Nearby stars actually trace out a little circle, but you need a telescope to see it. All you really need to know is a parsec is about 3.3 light years. I know it's confusing that both units of astronomical distance sound like time. It's unclear whether George Lucas really knew what a parsec was when he wrote the script. After all, this is one of the most common misconceptions in astronomy. I see it all the time. And Alan Dean Foster actually corrected the mistake when he wrote the novelization. Even the marketing materials from 1977 screwed up units of distance and time. It's a spectacle, light years ahead of its time. In the 1990s, the Expanded Universe books came up with the idea that the Kessel Run is a route to minimize distance, not time. The solo movie took the same basic idea, that you have to have really fancy calculations and a really daring pilot to take this shortcut that goes near black holes. Just did the castle run in 12 parsecs. But then why does he say the distance was 12 parsecs? That's not the shortcut distance. That goes through hyperspace. If you're going through normal space, it would take you 39 years traveling at the speed of light to go 12 parsecs. So the whole thing makes no sense. Some early versions of the script say that Han is obviously lying. But that's all been undercut by the Solo movie, which says that he's telling the truth. So if you're against the descoundrelification of having Greedo shoot first, yes, I bet you have. You should also be against the solo movie, making him not even a liar. This is why you've got to get science right, kids. You don't want to have 40 years of writers fixing your mistakes. There's another ship coming in. It's an Imperial fighter. Okay, what's a tie fighter? Well, the real reason for the name is that they look like a bow tie. But in the universe of Star Wars, TIE stands for Twin Ion Engine. And if you look closely, you can see them as little red dots on the back of the ships. That was science fiction in 1977. But we actually have 
real ion engines on spacecraft in the solar system today. NASA's Dawn mission visited the asteroid Vesta and the asteroid Ceres. Ion engines work by accelerating charged particles away from the ship. The problem is they have really small thrust, only equivalent to about the weight of a sheet of paper. So ships with ion engines aren't going to be able to change direction as fast as we see the TIE fighters do. In fact, to go from 0 to 60 miles an hour, it would take four days. The advantage is that these engines are high efficiency, so they only use a tiny amount of fuel. They do need a lot of power though, so they have big solar panels. That looks exactly like what we see on the sides of TIE fighters. And the Dawn spaceship is also about the size of a human. When Star Wars was made, we hadn't even seen an asteroid up close. Uh, we come out of hyperspace with a meteor shower, some kind of asteroid collision. But today, we basically have real TIE fighters in the solar system checking them out. Look at him, he's heading for that small moon. That's no moon. It's a space station. It's too big to be a space station. Actually, that is a small moon. That's Mimas, constructed from real data from the Cassini space mission. At 250 miles in diameter, it's the smallest body in the solar system that's been crushed into a sphere by its own gravity. It looks like the Death Star! But that's just a coincidence. Star Wars was released in 1977, and Mimas wasn't seen up close until the Voyager missions in 1980. Its surface is dominated by a single enormous crater, 80 miles across, caused by an impact that almost smashed Mimas to pieces. Now the Death Star is a whole marvel of physics in and of itself, a machine planet. It represents the loss of humanity through mechanization, a theme that's returned to often in the trilogy. He's more machine now than man, twisted and evil. But how much energy would it take to blow up a planet? We can actually calculate that. It's just the binding energy, or how much energy it takes to hold it together. The formula is 3g m squared over 5r, where g is the gravitational constant, m is the mass, and r is the radius. We don't really know how big Alderaan is, but for argument's sake we can say it's about the size of the Earth. It really doesn't matter for these calculations. Putting the mass and radius into the equation, we get that the binding energy is 2 times 10 to the 32 joules. To put that in perspective, that's at about a billion times the energy in all the fossil fuels on Earth, or about the energy output of the sun for a week. So when Vader says, the ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the force, he is such a liar, okay? He can't think apart a planet. It takes him like five seconds just to choke somebody. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Nine beams combine in the Death Star laser. That means each one is about 10 to the 31 joules, which is equivalent to the daily energy output of the sun from its entire surface. Okay, that means these guys have the worst job in the universe. They would just be Death Star engineer vapor, okay? You don't even need to destroy the Death Star. Everybody who knows how to use the laser would have been wiped out the first time they used it. Which brings us to this idea. Somewhere in space, this may all be happening right now. If Star Wars happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, could we see it through a telescope? The supernova that happened in 1987 was so bright you could see it with the naked eye. The destruction of Alderaan would have been about a billion times fainter. But we could have seen it with the Hubble Space Telescope at that distance. So I don't know about a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, but if it was a galaxy close, close by, about 163,000 years ago, yes, we could have seen it. That's about 50,000 parsecs. And unlike Han Solo, I know what those are. Star Wars, a billion years in the making, and it's coming to your galaxy this summer. a long time ago is really just telling us that this is a fairy tale. And as fairy tales go, it's the greatest. It gave kids permission to have a fantasy world set in space. I was inspired to be an astronomer by watching Star Wars as a kid. 
And I've been lucky enough to participate in some pretty incredible discoveries, like the discovery of dark energy, new types of supernova, and even the first kilonova. Long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, two neutron stars merged together. Now multiply that by millions of engineers, scientists, and artists who've been able to dream beyond what people could have imagined before. So forget a little nitpick here or there. The real legacy of Star Wars may be that it's the most scientifically inspirational movie of all time. There's a reason it takes like eight years to get a doctorate in linguistics. It's actually like really complicated. I had to talk with the physicists. I'm like, okay, great. Okay, I see why that makes sense. Why should anyone give a flying <laughs> I don't think you'll be able to use this. This is too physics geeky. Yeah, that's the thing I've spent zero time in my life as a linguist thinking about. How do you talk to an alien? Uh, I guess the right answer is careful.